Hi, we're back with uh, number six in the series of videos uh, that I'm making um, with um, histories and stuff like that and stories and whatnot. Um, I want to thank everybody for the uh, the support and the really good comments and and the amazing uh, uh, the fact that uh, there's a hundred subscribers to this thing channel whatever it is and that blows my mind because um, uh, I figured you know there'd be a couple dozen people watching and uh, maybe three or four the subscribers and that would be it um, hundreds of people watching the videos and um, 100 subscribers that's amazing that blows my mind so I thank you very much also wonderful comments thank you very much and personal messages and stuff like that that I'm getting that uh, it, it, it touches my heart it really does it's really really cool and uh, it's, it's a kind of a humbling kind of experience um, what I wanted to touch on today and hopefully this today's video won't be as long as the other videos that I've been doing but um, um, I want to start with a gentleman who some people only knew as a vice principal. Uh, and, but I knew him as much, much more than that. And that's Mr. Julian Kraft, who passed away, oh, more than 10 years ago, if not even probably more than that. And he had something called acute leukemia. He was fine one day, and then a few days later, he was in the hospital, and he passed away. Um, literally never saw it coming. Um, but uh, he was head of history at Ar Arendelle. And um, he, uh, he really enjoyed it, but he wanted to become a principal. And so he became a vice principal and went to Westwood in 1984. And he was there for a number of years and never did get the kick upstairs to principal. He finally retired as a vice principal and um he always regretted leaving the classroom i know that when he, when he was vice principal at westwood he uh, did teach some history courses to keep his feet wet and um that's something i never wanted to do which was become like move up the ladder and become a principal and whatever um that's something called becoming part of the peter principle the peter principle means you're promoted up the ladder as far as you reach your level of incompetence and that's where you stay and that's pretty much what happened to Mr. Kraft unfortunately uh, he to be a principal you have to basically have not a lot of emotions um, and you have to have uh, Batesome <laughs> Is, uh, there's an English word for it, but, you know, I'm trying to keep it clean. You have to have um, a certain guts that to make decisions and to tell people off, to tell students off, to, to get rid of staff, to hire, fire, whatever. And his greatest um, weakness was his best asset, I think, which was his uh, empathy for students. And uh, he... He hated to suspend students. He really did. He pretty much had to be backed into a corner for him to suspend anybody. But he didn't have that certain killer instinct uh, that would have made him a principal. And I think because he didn't have that killer instinct, he was so good as, as a teacher, as a mentor, as an educator, as a friend. He was amazing. Um, I, I knew him in many other ways outside of the school. We were friends outside. And um, he was so learned. He, he had his knowledge of history and the Second World War, for example, in particular. He was a, a walking uh, encyclopedia of the Second World War, including the Holocaust. Um, his library at home, I mean, it makes this look ridiculous. Uh, he had a room that was literally wall-to-wall, -wall, floor to ceiling books, except for the window and the doorway. It was an amazing library that had, I don't know how many books in it. Um, and he, everything was read and everything was memorized. Um, 
but he had a wonderful sense of humor too. Um, we once played racquetball, which is that weird squash kind of game where you play it in a room where you can not only use the front wall, but you can use the side, ceiling, and back wall. And you play with a little rubber blue ball. And I wasn't a very good racquetball player, and he was. He was a big guy, but he was in shape. And he was in front of me, and I hit the ball, and I hit him squarely in the back of the head. He turned around, and he says, do that one more time, and I'm going to screw up your timetable. And I did it. I hit him in the back of the head a second time. He says, do that one more time, and I'm going to stuff this. And he said, where, I, I sh shall not say on public broadcasting. Um, so I made sure not to do it a third time. Um, when we went to Quebec City in 1985, um, some students will remember that trip. That trip has its own show. Um, uh, but we had a bus trip there and a bus trip back. And um, he, uh, the first day we were in Quebec City, we spent four hours roaming through stores for him looking for hairspray because he did the big comb over four hours looking for hairspray in Quebec City with all the food and everything and oh, no, no, I gotta find this I gotta find that so we went and that's what we did um, but he was a terrific terrific uh, um, uh, educator mentor some of the students who may have run into him may not see it the same way but Certainly, from a staff perspective, um, from a student perspective, there's a lot of respect for the guy. Um, he put together some incredible Remembrance Day assemblies um, where he would, and he was friends with a lot of veterans, a lot of soldiers in World War II. And as the years would, went on, we lost them the one year, one, one at a time, two at a time, until there were very, very few people left, and then he would reach out and grab people from the v Vietnam War. He managed to always pull in these really relevant people because his contacts were just networking. He was such a good um, person when it came to gathering in people. He was amazing. So... Um, if you knew Mr. Kraft, uh, this is a, I wanted to bring that back up to, uh, to, to talk about him. Um, he was, a, he, I mentioned that I was a goaltender at one time. He said, well, so was I. Um, and when he played, there were no face masks. When I started to play, there were no face masks. And he remembers, he says, I got one in the face and, and, uh, it was bleeding and everything. I said, I've had my nose broken three times. I said, I know, we get that. He says, but you're short. I said, yeah. He says, well, you're right in the line of fire. I'm tall. He was quite tall. And um, he says, I was always able to get out of the way. Well, it's a good idea. Um, but his knowledge, unfortunately, he, he passed away way too young. Um, he wanted to write a book of his experiences, and uh, that's basically what I'm doing online. Um, he would have done that. He was very acute and very tuned into the latest methods, and he would use them all. Um, so that was Mr. Kraft. First thing I, when he came to the school, and the first thing I said to him, I says, hello, Mr. K. And he looked at me with a big, huge hand. He went, that's your first mistake. So what happened? What did I say? What did I say? It's a C. Kraft with a C, not a K. Okay, I said, well, my name is Kaplan, with a C, not a K. Oh, okay, so we settled it right there. Um, the another person I wanted to talk about, um, this young gentleman popped into the school and played saxophone, began beginning band, um, sang, and we did an assembly, and he came up to me and said, I want to sing Amazing Grace by myself. I said, you mean a cappella? He said, no, by myself. I said, okay, you're on. And he did. And it just by himself on stage singing Amazing Grace, and the audience was 
dead silent. I mean, you know the Westwood audience. It's like a Shakespearean audience. There could be something on stage and they'd be talking and chatting and whatever and yelling and screaming. And um, When he was singing, there was no sound. No sound at all. Everybody was tuned right into him. And he became one of my best musicians. Um, he was a baritone sax player. Anything I gave him, I gave him alto sax. He accepted that. He ran with it. I gave him baritone sax. He accepted that. He ran with it. Um, he sang. Uh, and he became such a... He, well, he was already a very good singer. Um, and uh, he graduated, and he was, I think, my final musician of the year. I mean, there was nothing he couldn't do. Um uh, when uh, the day, the final day that I retired, the fi final day in the school, which was June something of 2014, he just happened to come in and pay me a visit. And if you look on my Facebook page and you scroll down to 19 to 19 to 2014 June, you're going to see him heading up the whole tribute page because I was going to keep it under wraps, and he, he blows the retirement thing all open and. Uh, with pictures of me and everything, and I figured, okay, the jig is up, so I better write something. So I did, and that followed with a whole bunch of people saying really nice things, and I appreciate that. Owen Lee is his name. Um, Owen is now a um, in charge of a congregational, the music department of a congregation in Halifax, and uh, he's maintained his singing and. Um, I've sort of kept tabs on him. I troll. I don't get into anybody's lives, but I wa if they post something, I watch what they're doing. And Owen, if you happen to be watching, very, very proud of you. Very proud of your accomplishments. He, I think he won York University's York Idol. And I think he was asked to be in Canadian Idol, but it would have meant missing school if the story goes properly. So he backed out of it. I think he could have won Canadian Idol. He was that good. He could have done anything. He could have sang anything. Um, what impresses me more is he directs a choir, and I've heard them, I've heard the recordings that he's done of them, and they're an extension of him, and that's so important. Much like, I suppose, if I was to conduct a band, the band is, is sort of an extension of me. And so uh, with Owen, it's, um, again... We've, I've, I've had, like, like the young lady in the other video that I did, um, I've been blessed to teach a lot of very, very high-end, very high-quality students, musicians, um, adults as well, and I'll get into that uh, in a minute, um, that, that I've been, um, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I stayed in the classroom for, and I didn't become a vice principal, and I didn't become a principal. Because uh, as a teacher or head of a department or whatever, you deal with all kinds of students. You deal with the good students, the bad students, the brilliant students, the idiots, <laughs> and there are lots of those. But the minute you become a vice principal, that all goes out the window. Who do you deal with? You deal with the idiots, the morons. You know, you chase people down on the sidewalk. Um, you know, you're dealing with not the cream of the crop and I didn't want that I didn't need the extra money and the extra I didn't have to wear a suit I didn't have to have my own office I didn't need the sign on the door vice principal I was very happy being in the classroom uh, I didn't want to be an administrator um, and so you know that's the way it went and so I was able to work with some phenomenal students um, some of you may know the name Blackburn. And when I came to the school, there was already a student there, a 17-year-old fellow by the name of Dwayne Blackburn, who was already an impressive, accomplished jazz keyboard player. Like, I mean, frighteningly good. And this guy could play. And I tried for years and years to teach him how to read music because he was totally self-taught, totally by touch, you know, and by ear. And so I never was successful in teaching him how to read because that would have meant going back to the basics and, and, and we just couldn't do it. But we tried. 
Um, some years later, his brother, Corey, came into the room as a drummer, and there are very, very few drummers that I've ever taught as good as Corey. Um, but then Corey spent a lot of time with me in, in the bands, learning my style, and he spent a lot of time in the summers playing for his father, Bob Blackburn. Robert Blackburn, Bob Blackburn, Bobby Dean Blackburn, as he prefers to be known. Um, and I taught him, and that's another story. Um, so the Blackburn family, which um, I, I didn't know very much about them, so I decided to ask questions. Um, and I would honestly say that that family, the Blackburn family, is more Canadian than I would say 80% or 90% of all the students that ever went to Westwood and Lincoln Alexander. Their family goes back generations in Canada. And um, the, the, between, uh, and well, Duane, um, even today the Blackburn brothers are, are performing. And if you get a chance to see them, and I have to regret that I, have, I haven't been able to, but I've, I know them and one day, and every time I want to go, the pl a place closes. Um, but you, you got to hear them. You got to listen. You got to go see them. And, and uh, absolutely, that's a, it's a, it's a must bucket list thing to do, is to see the Blackburns. Um, they are absolutely amazing. One Canada Day years ago, they put on a show at the little stage at Queen's Key, and oh, we must be going back about ten, fifteen years. Oh, amazing! Just amazing. Even back then. Um, Corey is to that band as close to like Jeff Porcaro would have been to Toto. That good. Um, and, uh, and Dwayne is, is an incredible singer as well as a uh, keyboard player. And they're, they've got their brother who plays guitar, Brooke, and, uh, um, occasionally they're joined by their other brother. Um, Bob shows up one day at the school. Now, at that time, Bob was um, in his late 60s. He shows up one day at the beginning of school in September, and uh, he's coming back to school. He wants to finish his high school diploma. It was the first, second, first or second semester. Second semester was a band class, a senior band class, and he enrolled in it. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, this guy started playing piano at a very young age, started singing in bars at 14 or 15 or 16. Um, before I was born, what could I teach him? You know, and I said to him, I said, what am I going to teach you? You already know everything. He said, Paul, I'm coming to your class. I'm going to be one of your students. You're the boss. You tell me what to do. I'll learn whatever I can and, and, and so on. So he learned, the, he learned the music that the band played. He learned the keyboard parts. And we even had him do uh, uh, a couple songs that had vocal lines to it for, like, for What a Wonderful World. Um, he did everything I asked him to do. And in the very, very, he was, his class was the last class of adult education before Mike Harris split off adult education from the regular academic schools because it was cheaper. Um, so he was the last adult valedictorian um, at uh, Westwood, uh, and uh, uh, just a remarkable. He's today he's somewhere up north. I'm not exactly sure what small town he lives in now. Still gigging, still playing, still singing. Uh, I think he's late seventies or eighty. Um, but uh, it, it was my privilege to work with the Blackburns, all of them, from Bob to his sons. Um, you know, you don't get that if you're a performer on stage. You don't get to work with these, these, these wonderful people. You don't get to get, um, there's a Yiddish word, nachas. You get nachas from watching someone you work with be successful. It's a good feeling inside. There's no other way to describe it. And that's the, the nachas you get from from watching um, uh, uh, an Owen Lee on stage or an Owen Lee conducting a choir or a Dwayne Blackburn performing or, a, a, you know, something like that. It, it's, uh, it's definitely um, a plus.
anyway, I've been very fortunate, and there are many, many more stories of students that that I've worked with that have gone on to be successful in in one way or another. Um, communications festival. This was uh, an extravaganza. It was originally put on by the English department, and it was a whole week. One day was a rehearsal kind of day, and the next four days were like four periods each day, like in, in school, a period one, two, three, five, one, two, four, five, where students would go on stage and perform, and they would go on, they can do um, a, a song, a poetry, a play, a this, a that, whatever they wanted to do. And we used to audition for them, we used to watch what they were doing, the story that I talked about in the first video about the young gentleman in the wheelchair who came out and um, played piano with his feet and got a standing ovation, which was significant because he could not stand without help, um, but he got a standing ovation. There were a lot of instances like that where people got on stage for the first and sometimes last time and got a measure of success in front of their peers and don't forget some of your if those of you who have done getting in front of the room and doing a presentation the toughest people to have in the audience are people who are like you right because uh, they're tough they're they, they're critical and um, we had the communications festival had poetry it had plays it had uh, songs um, singing, bands playing. Um, s there were a lot of fun parts to it. When I came on board, we provided the technical side of it. So we provided the uh, the lighting and the sound. Um, and the stage crew had got involved. And the work experience uh, just of doing the four shows, totally different shows a day for four days, 16 shows, um, and being able to have mics ready and cues and this and that and um, the lighting for each show was different and we had spotlights and um, it really trained a lot of students from the stage crew aspect of it and a lot of them got a lot of experience and said this is what they wanted to do. Um, but I, I'm going to go into the auditions, I'm running 22 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about some auditions. I'm going to lump the auditions together because auditions alone, they were like the auditions that you see on, on uh, American Idol with, with, uh, with the judges like you know throwing up on the side or Simon Cowell going, get off the stage and you're ugly and you, you can't sing. We had people come for the communications festival and um, there was one young gentleman, Punjabi, who I know for a fact he had arrived in uh, October or November. Uh, he certainly had never seen snow. He'd never seen a winter. His English was so basic and so rudimentary. But he went on stage and he wrote, he had written a poem in English and he went on stage to deliver the poem to, and, and, and this would be in April. So he'd only been there for four or five months, six months. And he did so, and it took such courage to do that. As his, name's for, his name escapes me at the time, uh, for now. But uh, I don't know if I were to go to Punjab and then five or six months later get up on stage and deliver a speech in Punjabi. I couldn't do it. We had another student from Poland. Now... If I were to type on a on a keyboard, and I have my eyes closed, I don't touch type. I watch my hands because if I don't watch my hands, okay, what I get on the screen is Polish, you know, or or some foreign alien language. Um, to me, I couldn't possibly learn another language. I just don't have it. I haven't got the screws in the right spot. But we had a student from Poland. Um, who again got on stage, wanted to read a um, a poem in Polish, and then she read it in English. Uh, she translated the poem, 
And it was really, really, really impressive and very moving because, and what guts it took to do that, you know. And I don't think she had ever had that opportunity both before or after to do that sort of thing. So the students not only had to have the bravery to get up on stage and perform, but perform in front of their own friends and, and peers and so on. And, you know, if they did a good job, people talked about, talked and congratulated them for like days and weeks afterwards. It was amazing to watch. I mean, we did that in April and May. There would still be people walking around the halls talking to people about, did you, did you, were you there? Um, there was one um, group of three or four young Jamaican friends who wanted to go up and do a play in Patois, and it, you didn't need a trans, translator. It was funny as anything. It was just wonderful, and it was done. They were so into it, and it was so good. We brought them back on the last day, and they did it again, and this, the theater only held 200 people, max, and so the maximum that could have seen them was 400 people. By the end of the year, a couple months later, there must have been 4,000 people who all said they were there. And they saw that play. Oh, yeah, they were there. Everybody saw that play. The whole school <coughs> the whole school saw that play. I don't know how, but they did. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the Communications Festival another time. And in a, I've got a couple seconds, a couple of minutes left. Um, and I want to bring, um, you know what, I'll, no, I'll save it for the next video. If I do it now, I'll be shortchanging the person that I want to talk about. So, I hope you've, uh, we've gone down memory lane with, uh, Mr. Kraft and Mo and Lee and Communications Festival. If you were in the Communications Festival, could you let me know, write me a note? Um, of what you did. I was there for every single show in at least 12 to 14 years that we did this. Every single show. So I saw every single act. Okay. If you were involved in the communications festival other than as a stage crew person, because we all saw every single act, but if you did a, something on stage, do me a favor. Let me know. Uh, remind me. Um, and I'll talk about it. Or maybe I won't. Depends. We'll see. Um, anyway, again, I thank you very much for the support. Uh, and I'll just keep on talking in the next bunch of videos. Uh, I figure I'll do about 10, maybe 15 videos. And hope you like the quality. It's a little bit better. It's a newer, um, webcam. And I've covered the the light above my head, which makes me look like the top half of, uh, um, you know, a melon. So I don't quite look as glowing as, as, as that. Um, the support that I've had from all you people and the messages that I've received and the comments and the subscriptions, click subscribe if you haven't already. It just makes me feel good, warms the cockles of my heart. Um, and um, stay safe. Get vaccinated. And um, be good. We'll see you later.